Hello, and welcome back to Rails Quest. Today, we're going to look at the Ruby on Rails versus Wild tool. This is a, an open source gem, which has a few features for development without even using the service, plus a software as a service backend that you have to pay for on a usage basis. But what you gain from that is production performance monitoring, along with error reporting and a few other goodies. So we're going to take a look at my first impressions of using this tool. Uh, I only just deployed it to production and it's been running pretty well. I did run into one or two little issues, but overall it was a very smooth onboarding experience. I'm going to show you the bug that I ran into because it's important for you to know that it's a pretty early tool to adopt. I think it's fine for low risk projects that don't have a business critical nature about them that can tolerate rough edges that come with using a small tool like this, but you'll see what it is and you can judge for yourself without any further ado, let's dig a little bit deeper. So this is the Ruby on Rails versus Wild How It Works page. So they go into a little bit of detail about how they're a small team and they like it that way and they run on a very simple Rails stack very traditional Ruby on Rails, Postgres, and Redis. So what they do is they collect metrics, they process them, they store them for 30 days, and they give you a nice dashboard to get some insights into your application, how it runs, what errors are happening, and you can use that to troubleshoot and debug production issues as they come up. A little peek behind the scenes. This is one of my apps that I've deployed this tool with, and you can see it gives you some nice information about the requests. It gives you really what you need to know about requests right up front. And it shows you the worst, the most impactful in their terminology, endpoints. So that gives you a to-do list. If you're wanting to clean up some performance issues, you come here and you can see the top one is the credits controller index page. So that might be something I want to dig into and try and resolve sometime soon. It also gives you some insights into your jobs, your background jobs. So you can see what the slowest ones are and any other information that you need to get from there. It'll even show you the most impactful sections of code. As far as the interface goes, here's an error, an example of that. Show you a little bit of the stack trace there, which is nice. And this error is actually what I'm going to show you in just a little bit. So that's a preview, a little spoiler alert there. And deployment, I don't have this configured right now. Let's see. So it looks like the way I'm deploying with Kamal, it's not automatically hooked into that. So that's something I would need to look into hooking into. There's there's a configuration for deployments and I just haven't looked at it yet. So that's something to know. If you use Kamal to deploy, correct me if I'm wrong about this or if I'm missing something, but I've run a few deployments since deploying with Roar versus Wild and I have not seen any deployments come through in their dashboard. And you can see some servers that I've got running here. So if you've got multiple servers, you can see how it's performing on each one and maybe isolate issues there. The dashboard is very simple, very clean. It shows you, it shows me exactly what I want to know right up front. So I am happy with that. And here's another little preview. This is what you get in development, even if you don't use the production server. So this is a nice little interface into the current page. It shows you some performance stats about each relevant bit of code. You can see the SQL was run and you can get some information about the timing. Similar thing for jobs that were kicked off recently, and it logs errors for you, which is very nice. And that's what you get right here in the development environment. And it gives you a prompt to create an account if you need to. So that shows you around what you can expect to get in terms of functionality. Let's take a look at the setup. Installing the gem, very straightforward. Once I had added this to my gem file and run bundle install and restarted the server, I immediately saw this little badge that I just showed you. That was available right away. So that was impressive. And here you can see, you can navigate to Roar versus Wild, the root. Let's give that a try. So yeah, you can see it as a dedicated page as well. And when you look at it this way, it gives you a listing of all the requests rather than automatically showing you the current page. Now let's scroll down to production mode. So I had already completed these. So then I could go and get my API key and run this handy install command. What this did was it created a configuration file. So let's jump into the code here. So again, the only change I made was right here. So I'll show you the commit. We added it to the gem file. You can see in gem file block, we all we did was add the roar versus wild 
child dependency. So that's nice. It doesn't have a bunch of other things that it installs. And it created this roar versus wild.yaml file. That was the entire commit to get it installed. And we'll take a look at this commit. This was to fix the issue that I've referenced before. So this is the configuration file. I've blocked out my API key there. You can see, you can set an editor URL for GUI editors. I'm not sure how much luck you're going to have if you know the answer to this. If you use NeoVim in the terminal, how does this work out for you or are you out of luck? I'd be okay with MacVim or even a GUI NeoVim and maybe give that a shot. But I don't have VS Code or Sublime. What that gives you in here, I noticed this earlier. If you look at the URL down at the bottom of my screen, you may not be able to see it. If I click these links, it doesn't do anything. If I had VS Code installed, it would launch VS Code at that location. So that's pretty handy. So now let's look at the issue that I ran into here. I need to create a scenario where I'm rendering an empty collection. Okay, so let's say if I destroy all of the conversions from the app, then I have no conversions yet. But what happens if I do what I had before? It's not a best practice because most of the time if you have something blank, you do want to render an alternative, right? So I have an empty collection here that I'm trying to render. And it's good to render some sort of alternative to show the user that, hey, there's nothing here. If we take a look at the commit that I had to make after installing Ruby on Rails versus Wild, this is what broke after I installed it. We can take a quick look, a quick summary of why this isn't working and take a look at the issue that I submitted against the gem. So maybe this will be improved soon. But what it does not handle is rendering an empty collection. And again, I'll, I'll tell you why. That seems random, but I'll tell you why right after I demonstrate what happens here. When we initially go to generate some tweets from a YouTube video. There's no tweets. And you can see that right here, no tweets yet. And this is the change that I had to make. It's probably best practice to do it this way anyway, but I'm just trying to move fast, get something together. I'm not thinking too deeply about things like a blank state in this case, because if nothing's there, nothing's there. And when something needs to be there, it will appear. Be that as it may, there are legitimate times when you would want to render an empty collection if if there's nothing available. You just may not care what it looks like when there's nothing there, or maybe it's the correct state for nothing to be there at all, not even to have a placeholder when there's nothing available in the collection. So this is a totally, all I'm saying is this is totally legitimate, totally fine to do. This is probably better. It's definitely better for this case, but this is also acceptable for a simple early stage technology demo that we've got here. But what happens when I convert to tweets? What we get is a cryptic error. Undefined methods start with nil. Well, there's nothing nil about this. If we run this, it's not nil, it's a collection proxy. And rendering an empty collection is generally a fine thing to do. Nothing in this application trace gives you any clues as to what's going on here. You have to dig into the framework level trace. Then you can start to get a little information. So basically we're down here in the guts of the Roar versus Wild gem where it is doing something with the notification payload and that is nil. And inside this relative path method, it's not showing the code here. It does a check for starts with on whatever you pass into it. So this crazy error, I think demonstrating it shows you a little bit of the troubleshooting process you can do when you get a weird error with a new gem or a weird error period. You can dig in and get a fuller trace. You don't even have to go to the console and you can play around with values in here. We can see what the payload is, right? And what's going on here is we can go a little bit higher in the stack trace. There we go. That's what I was looking for. Name. So what the library is doing is it has subscribed to the render collection dot action view notification notification, which is built into Rails. So Rails, whether you know it or not, it has this feature called instrumentation. Most of the features in your Rails app are spitting out these notifications all the time, whether you're using them or not. This is something that's good to know. You may not need to build your own instrumentation yourself. You may be able to hook into something that Rails does. The issue though, is that when you are rendering a empty collection, Rails does not have a whole lot of information about what it is that you're attempting to render. And so so this identifier ends up nil as a result. Uh, you can debate the correctness of that, whether Rails should try to do something for you in that case. But I'll say this, when I looked at the code in the Rails
Rails code base, the code that fires off this instrumentation notification has been around for years. So this is an established pattern, and I think it's safe to say that this library, the Roar versus Wild Gem, should handle a nil value in this payload. So I have an issue on Roar versus Wild, error when rendering empty collection, and I just give a little bit of context there. If you want to follow along, if this is a deal breaker for you and you just want to see if this gets resolved, feel free to go and check out that issue. But in the meantime, there's a very easy workaround and one might argue that this makes your code even better. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. This is an honest review of this monitoring service and this puts me on high alert. I've used other services in the past, everything from AWS CloudWatch to a service called Skylight. There's any number of services that you could use and some that are more well-known. Fly.io has some of this built in as well. And so what I'm saying is use with caution. It might be something to explore. It definitely has an appealing set of features. It's very clean UI. It shows you exactly what you need to know and no more than that, which I like. They want to be the one person framework monitoring tool and I think that's a noble goal. I, I wish them well. I hope that they succeed in that because selfishly I want to benefit from a tool like that. But that is the state of things today and I will be watching this project with interest. To summarize, what I think I would recommend in this instance is proceed with caution. It's very easy to set up so it's a no-brainer in terms of testing it out at least locally. I would say only test it on a production server if you test it on something like a staging server first, maybe spin one up even and see how it performs in the real world. Put it through its paces locally. You saw I was able to reproduce that particular error locally. No guarantees on that. So this is something that you want to do in installing any kind of third-party gem, especially one that integrates so close to Rails. Anyway, with that, this was fun to check out. It was fun to present. Let me know what you think. Leave comments. Please like and subscribe and share the channel with everybody you know who would be interested. And with that, have a blessed week. I'll see you next time. Hey guys, quick update for you. So before I posted this video, the Ruby on Rails versus Wild team actually got back to me on the bug that I reported. And lo and behold, just a few days ago, 1.9.1 was released and it includes the fix to the bug that I reported, which is a crash when rendering an empty collection because of the instrumentation. And here's the issue that I submitted and, and you can see that it's closed and I've tested it in my application and it works great. And since you have watched this far and I have played around with Roar vs. Wild a little bit more, I'm gonna show you one extra bonus tip. I'm really loving the Roar vs. Wild service. Here it is, revision. This tells Roar vs. Wild what version of your app is running so it can mark the moment when you deploy a new version. This is useful for seeing a spike in the number of errors or a difference in the performance of your application between different versions of your code. So you can see the clear line where you made a deployment of new code and see what that affected. So that's just a little bonus tip for you. I'm really loving the service. I've seen some errors come through that were legitimate errors in my app that maybe I wouldn't have noticed and they came right to my inbox and I have all the data that I need to start the investigation from there. So I'm really happy with this. I think it has potential to be the one man framework monitoring tool for Rails. And that's all I got for you. Thanks. Bye.